In this video, we're going to look at additional examples of reactions that feature radical intermediates. One that we're very familiar with already is anti-Markovnikov or radical hydrohalogenation. Notably, this reaction only works for HBr. This is because one or the other of the steps of propagation is disfavored when HCl or HI are used. So quickly here, let's just draw out the two steps of propagation. In the first step, the X radical adds to the alkene. And in the second step, the resulting alkyl radical abstracts a hydrogen from HX, generating the product and a new X radical. We can see the problem here if we look at bond dissociation energies relevant to this reaction. In the first step, essentially we've traded a carbon-carbon pi bond for a carbon X sigma bond. A typical energy for a carbon-carbon pi bond is about 67 kilocalories per mole. And for a carbon iodine bond, the energy is only 57 kilocalories per mole. So this is 10 kilocalories per mole uphill in energy for iodine. Put another way, this step is endothermic when HI is used. That's a problem in radical chain mechanisms because HI will react much more rapidly in a polar addition mechanism giving rise to the Markovnikov product. This puts radical hydroiodination out of reach. The second step poses a problem for HCl, and we can see this if we explore the bonds made and broken and the associated bond dissociation energies. The HX bond has an energy of 103 kilocalories per mole, but the CH bond has an energy of only 100 kilocalories per mole. That means that this step is endothermic when X is chlorine, or in other words, when HCl is used. The HBr bond energy hits a sweet spot where both addition to the pi bond and abstraction of a hydrogen from HBr are exothermic. Believe it or not, we can take advantage of radical chemistry to engage with alkane CH bonds. This is what happens in the so-called photohalogenation reaction, in which bromine or chlorine are used to substitute for hydrogen in an alkane. This results in a highly useful conversion of alkanes to alkyl halides. Because this reaction involves a radical, substitution occurs selectively at the most substituted carbon. Here's an example of this reaction that uses propane, and we can see here that we have both methyl hydrogens and methylene hydrogens at the central carbon. Under these conditions, which involve the use of relatively high energy light and sometimes somewhat elevated temperatures in order to generate X radicals, bromine or chlorine radicals, the more substituted secondary carbon reacts selectively and one of the CH bonds is replaced with a bond to X, where again, X is either chlorine or bromine. Of course, this occurs without stereoselectivity since the radical intermediate is more or less flat. In the second example, the substrate is tert butane, which has nine methyl hydrogens and a single methine hydrogen at the center of the molecule. Here again, because radical intermediates are involved, the major product of reaction of this substrate is formed via substitution of the methine or tertiary proton, since the radical that develops at this tertiary carbon is the most stable of the possible radicals. One interesting thing to note about photohalogenation is that bromine is much more selective in this reaction than chlorine. We're going to explore why in a second, but I want to give you a sense of the selectivity issue here. As we just noted, both chlorine and bromine are selective for the methine hydrogen in tert butane. When Cl2 is used as the reagent, we get about 64% tert-butyl chloride and about 36% isobutyl chloride, which, which is this substrate in which the halogen is substituted at one of the methyl positions. That's pretty good considering pure statistics shows us that there are nine methyl hydrogens to only one methine hydrogen. So there is a relatively high selectivity ratio ignoring those statistics going on here. But when we use bromine instead, the observed selectivity is remarkable. We get over 99.9% .9 of the product is tert-butyl bromide, and less than 0.1% is isobutyl bromide. Why is bromine so much more selective than chlorine in this reaction? This actually has a lot to teach us about reactions in general, as we'll see. Let's focus in on the key first step of propagation in this reaction, which involves abstraction of the hydrogen atom by the halogen radical leading to an alkyl radical intermediate, and HBr. Based on the bond dissociation energies here, we know that this step is actually significantly uphill in energy. It's endothermic, since the bond we're forming, HBr, is weaker than the bond we broke, H carbon. 
Furthermore, there will be a significant difference in the stability of the resulting radical intermediates, depending on whether we generate a tertiary radical, which leads to tert-butyl bromide, or a primary radical, which leads to isobutyl bromide. These two products are associated with distinct transition states. But because the reaction is uphill in energy, those transition states will very closely resemble the products. This is a consequence of Hammond's postulate, which says that the transition state resembles the species to which it's closest in energy. The important practical implication here is that there's a large energy gap between the two transition states, and this translates into kinetic selectivity for formation of the tertiary radical over the primary radical. Of course, when chlorine radical is involved instead of bromine radical, we have a similar situation on the product side in terms of stability. The tertiary radical, whose pathway I'm going to draw in blue, remains considerably more stable than the primary radical. However, now this step is approximately thermoneutral, and we can see this if we look at the bond dissociation energies. The HR bond, or H carbon bond, is similar in BDE to the HCl bond. Now the transition states for these steps are much closer to halfway between the reactants and the products. This means they're much less product-like, and so the stability difference on the product side appears to a much smaller degree in the transition states when chlorine is used. This results in much lower selectivity for tert-butyl chloride, which comes from the tertiary radical, relative to isobutyl chloride coming from the primary radical. The fact that the reactants and products are almost equal in energy means that the transition states don't feel as much of the product energy difference as they do in the bromine case. One important reaction of radicals that we either need to watch out for in order to avoid or need to control in order to take advantage of is radical polymerization. Radical polymerization involves the repeated addition of a radical across a pi bond. If you think about how addition across a pi bond works, each addition generates a new radical. This means that a newly generated radical can continue to add carbons to itself through repeated additions to pi bonds. In general, the process works like this. We have some radical R dot, and this may be an initiator radical or an alkyl radical, that engages with a molecule of alkene to generate a new radical, and this occurs through a radical addition process. Note the selectivity here for the more substituted radical. Once this radical is formed, as soon as it bumps into another molecule of alkene, it can engage in the same radical addition process, again with Markovnikov selectivity, leading to the formation of a new secondary radical. This can happen again as soon as this alkyl radical bumps into yet another molecule of alkene to form a product in which two more carbons have been added to the chain, and so on and so forth, leading to a very long chain of carbons with substituents, these R groups, at every other carbon. The particular example shown here uses a monomer called styrene, and it gives a polymer that you're probably very familiar with, polystyrene or styrofoam. This reaction type involves a very large number of propagation steps, but every propagation event is essentially the same. It's the addition of an alkyl radical to a molecule of alkene monomer. Polymerization is ended through termination events, and there are a few different ways termination can happen. Two long chain alkyl radicals can couple with each other, forming an even electron carbon chain whose length is the sum of the lengths of the two alkyl radicals, or an initiator radical. Here, OR dot can combine with an alkyl radical to give a polymer that's capped or ended with an OR group, and other strange things can happen in radical polymerizations like the abstraction of a hydrogen in the middle of a chain followed by a branching event. The relative rate of these different types of steps depends on the concentration of monomer, the type and concentration of initiator used, and factors like this. And one interesting thing to note about this is that the relative rates of propagation and termination largely determine the size of the polymer chains that we get out. The faster propagation is relative to termination, the longer the chain, and vice versa. This goes back to a point we made earlier about radical reactions, which is that the balance between the rates of propagation and termination is very important in the outcome of a radical reaction. Photohalogenation doesn't quite work when the substrate contains a carbon-carbon double bond, even though the radical that would be generated adjacent to that double bond would be resonance stabilized. This is because the would-be reagent, Br2, prefers to add to the alkene in a halogenation reaction, a reaction we've already seen, 
rather than engaging in radical chemistry. A method for getting around this involves the use of a reagent called n bromosuccinamide or NBS, and that's the structure that's shown here. n bromosuccinamide is an electrophilic source of bromine that supplies a small amount of Br2 when it reacts with trace hydrobromic acid, a very small amount of hydrobromic acid in the reaction mixture. Br2 is generated through protonation of the succinamide nitrogen first by the strong acid, HBr, followed by SN2 by the bromide anion at bromine. Notice that protonation of the succinamide nitrogen has turned this whole group into a good leaving group, since departure with a pair of electrons generates a neutral product, succinamide. The very small amount of Br2 generated in this process participates selectively in radical halogenation via the formation of bromine radical. And in a substrate that contains a double bond, this reaction will occur selectively at the carbons adjacent to the double bond, the allylic carbons. This substrate has two allylic carbons, but they're equivalent to each other. The final product here, after radical halogenation, is the product of substitution at one of the allylic positions of bromine for hydrogen. And the nice thing about this, just like in the photohalogenation case that we saw previously, is that this substrate can then be taken on to further reactions, like nucleophilic substitution, elimination, or others.